Welcome to Jazz Zone Together, our new online community where we will provide jazz and music education and classroom resources, interviews with educators, artists, and celebrities, along with valuable tips and repertoire suggestions. Today, we welcome one of the most highly respected names in the music world, Howard Reich. Howard was the music critic for the Chicago Tribune from 1978 to 2021. Howard is an author, journalist, and filmmaker. He's been awarded an Emmy and two honorary doctorates. Now I'll turn the mic over to Dick Dunscombe to, turn, to conduct the interview with Howard. Dick, it's all yours. Thank you, Bob and Howard. How much of a pleasure this is to see you. Welcome, my friend. It's a reunion. I, I always had a great time working with you in Chicago, and it's great to be connected with you now in cyberspace. That's, that's wonderful. And, and um, you know, I miss, I miss Chicago, and I miss you and all the wonderful activities that were going on up there. So uh, it's, it's certainly a pleasure, of course, to welcome you to Jazz Zone together today. Would you please uh, give us an outline how did you get started in music from your younger age? Well, I had a great revelation when I turned 16 years old. I went downstairs in my family's home. I turned on the TV and an amazing movie was just starting, a movie I'd never seen or heard of before, An American in Paris. And this was music of George Gershwin, choreography by Gene Kelly, piano virtuosity by Oscar Levant. This was a life-changing moment for me. After seeing that movie, I realized I had to take piano lessons. I had to learn to play the concerto in F. Within two years, I was a, a music major at Northwestern University, piano performance major, and uh, just absorbing all this repertoire. Was a, it was a luxury for me. And by my senior year of Northwestern, it occurred to me that being locked up in a practice room eight hours a, a day was not the right fit for me. It was just, I, when I was in the practice room, I was wondering what's going on out there in the rest of the world. But it occurred, I remembered, I knew I've, I've always been a writer my whole life. Why don't I write about music? And when I had that idea, that was transformative because within months of having that idea, I was freelancing for the Chicago Daily News and then freelancing for the Chicago Tribune and then hired by the Tribune where I spent my entire career. Wow. It sounds like it was made in heaven. It just, yeah, it was it just very was fortunate. Made to be. Well, okay. Uh, you know, our viewers are ranged from uh, students and uh, teachers of music and just uh, fans of music. So I'm sure that they would like to know, uh, what, what does a critic do? Tell us about your role and, and what happens. Well, I think many people misunderstand what a critic does. Musicians often think that a critic's job is to promote their product and, and promote their career. And if you write a great review of that artist, you're a genius. And if you write a negative review of that artist, you're a hack. Uh, that is not what we do. In fact, occasionally when a musician will call or would call me at the Tribune to complain about something I would write, I would tell them, I did not write that review for you. I'm not trying to give you music lessons. I'm not telling you how to do your art. You are not my audience. My audience is the readers of the Chicago Tribune, which is a general interest reader all over Chicago and due to the internet all over the world. And my role as a critic, I believe, is to do nothing more nor less than express my opinion, but it must be an informed opinion. Everybody's got an opinion. I have to persuade the reader why they should be compelled by my opinion. So I'm writing for my audience. And I always tell the musicians, don't worry about what I say. Now, that might sound very glib. Oh yeah, easy for you to say you write a negative review and then I'm stuck with it. Well, I'll tell you, I write books and films also. I'm on the receiving end of reviews also. And I want those critics to say what they think, but that will have no impact, or at least it should have no impact on what I do. That's their opinion. My opinion is expressed through my work and the musician's view is expressed through their work. So that to me is the essence of, if I had to say it in one phrase, what I do as a critic is to be a disinterested, informed opinion, period. Okay. 
Well, I know that you're highly regarded and highly respected throughout all of the artists that, that appear. So you've done it right, my friend. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's been a beautiful journey. You have any stories that you could tell us maybe about one or two of the interviews? Oh, there are so many. Um, I, I don't know. I'll tell you one about one of my uh, disastrous interviews that just comes to mind. At one point I had, I was very excited that I was going to get to interview the great Cab Calloway, who I always regarded as much more than a movie star and a great entertainer, but a, a, a band leader and a great vocalist, a magnificent baritone, underrated in that accord. So I've been watching Cab Calloway's movies uh, for decades, and now he's going to be coming to the Ravinia Festival in the Chicago area, and I was going to go to White Plains, New York, to interview him. I arrived there. Uh, my wife and I, she came with me. We come into the house. And we all know Cab Calloway on stage is, is a maniac. He's all over the stage. He's singing, he's dancing, he's talking, he's irrepressible. And I ask him my first question and he answers with a one word answer. <laughs> and then I move on to my next question and it's another word. And the series of answers are, yep, nope, I don't know, <laughs> maybe. I'm thinking this, I, in six minutes, I'm done with all my questions and I don't have anything. I do not have an interview. I could not believe it. How could this be? Cab Kelly is a maniac. Then he insisted on driving my wife and I back to the train station from his house. And while he's driving, the stories are flowing. He's oh. talking everything that I wanted to get, you know? <laughs> and of course, unfortunately, my tape recorder is not rolling at this point. Uh, but I'm trying to scribble notes while not getting motion sickness. And that's how I got the story of Cab Calloway. Mm -hmm. So it's always a little unpredictable what's going to happen when you interview somebody. Um, I, I, I've just, I, to me, it's just been a great privilege to meet and spend time with so many great artists over the past 40 plus years. Uh, Winter Marcellus, uh, Ornette Coleman, uh, the great singers. Um, it's, it's just I, literally hundreds and hundreds of, of musicians. And that has been the great privilege of this career of mine. Because we go to school, we go to music school, we learn, uh, we learn the technical elements, we would learn what makes music put together, melody, harmony, structure, sonata form, all these things that we learn, we learn how to read a score, everything. We learn how to play in a group, solo. And then my career begins and I can ask the world's greatest artists any question I wanna ask. It's really a lifelong postgraduate education. So the things that I don't see in books that are not addressed by these artists, I can ask them. I can ask them anything I want. And that's been the privilege of this existence. In addition to getting to hear them all in concert, is to getting, getting to ask them what I, what I need to know uh, and then sharing that information. So it's a, it's a privilege. You know, Arthur Rubenstein in his memoir, My Young Years or, or My Many Years, one of those two volumes, he says, don't tell anybody, but I would have done this all for free. <laughs> This is the privilege that they paid me to do it is itself incredible. But this is what I wanted to do. Meet these great artists and ask them about the secrets of what they of what they do. Oh, my goodness. What a privilege and what a pleasure. You know, uh, both of us spent I've spent a little bit of time in Chicago, 11 years. But you've been there, you know, through your college years and up through the Give, give our uh, in audience an informed synopsis of what music means and what is the music scene throughout the years in Chicago. So yeah, I was also, I was born here in Chicago. I grew up here. I went to school here. I worked here. They won't let me out. <laughs> this is where I'm, sp I'm spending my entire life. Uh, but that has been an advantage in a way too, because I've been able to watch the scene professionally for 43 years and of course growing up. I think Chicago is unique musically and otherwise. Of course, every city is. Anybody who grows up in a great musical city, New York, New Orleans, Boston, they all have their own particular profile. To me, Chicago is a city of, of, of independence, of iconoclasts, of rogues, of people who do it their own way. I think Chicago, since the early days of jazz, has always incredibly embraced the revolutionaries, the people who don't do what is expected of them in more commercial hubs, such as New York or Los Angeles, the coastal cities. Uh, Jelly Roll Morton, who I consider the first jazz composer, came to Chicago as early as 1910. 
Louis Armstrong, we know, came in 1922, was here for two years, went to New York and came back and did his famous recordings. They were, they were re rebels against the current tradition. They were playing a music that was new, that was thrillingly new. And they came to Chicago and Chicago embraced them. And that's why Chicago is so, I, I believe Chicago is so wrapped up with the history of jazz because jazz, the word jazz to me is almost synonymous with innovation. It's been, an, uh, it's been, it's been intimately involved with innovation, all of, its, all of its history, new ideas. And Chicago has embraced them. That's why Louis Armstrong became a star in Chicago in the 1920s. You couldn't get us, you couldn't get us a, a seat where he was playing. And Chicago has always nurtured that. Um, our Tatum was here. Kyle Basie had his, his uh, mid-sized band here. When you, if, let me put it to you this way. I believe if you took Chicago out of the history of jazz, there would be large looming holes there. Where would we be without Joe Williams, without Nat King Cole, without Captain Walter Diet, you know, without Von Freeman, Ramsey Lewis, I could go on for days. And though each city has its profile, I think Chicago's contribution to jazz has been fundamental and foundational. Amen to that. Yeah. It really has been. So if a person today was interested in becoming a music critic, what would your, uh, what would your uh, suggestions and wise notes mean? Well, I think it's a mixed, it's a mixed situation. Um, let me just take, please take a sip. It's both harder and easier than when I started out. When I started out, uh, my first published pieces, I think, were in 1976 for the Chicago Daily News, which was then the number three newspaper in Chicago in 1978 when I started writing for the Tribune. There were more newspapers then. There were more outlets then of that kind. There were more full-time jobs doing that. That does not exist now. There are far fewer newspapers and there are far fewer music critics. I left the Chicago Tribune. I retired from the paper in January and I was the last music critic on the staff of the Tribune. Most newspapers do not have uh, full-time staff critics. There are some, there are few left, but most don't. That's the downside. The positive side is that the web, the internet is explosive. There are so many for forums for expressing your ideas. You can write a blog, you can create films, you can do all these things on the internet that were not available at the time. And then someone might say, oh yeah, but you, you were working for a big newspaper, so you got paid well. Let me tell you, when I started freelancing for the Chicago Daily News, I got $7.50 per article. <laughs> Even in 1976, that did not get you very far. Um, when I was freelancing for the Tribune, it got a little bit better. You, all careers start from nothing and all careers build. If I were today starting this kind of a career, I would have to find another way of putting this together. In other words, I would not be looking for a full-time job being a critic at a newspaper. There are too few of those. Sometimes students ask me that. I say, that's not the way to go. You have to invent a way to go it. There are other ways. There's NPR, there's public radio stations, there are radio stations across the country, there are magazines. You have to put it together. But I would just say to anyone interested in doing this, everybody has the salad days of their career, when they're in their 20s, when they're building it. But you just, you build it and it will happen. They say, you know, build it and they'll come. I say, build it and it will happen. If it can happen to me, it can happen to others. But it will happen in a different way for performers now. But I think there's more, more music journalism available now than there was when I started out. It's just that it's online and it's in different forms and people have to figure out how to make a living doing it. That's good information. You know, you've often written and lectured on the importance of music and especially jazz in our culture. How important is this in the evolution of our culture? Well, to me, what's magical about music is that it doesn't involve words. Now I know of course, opera and song cycles and American popular song do, but music at its, at its core is about how sound feels, its sensuousness and what it tells us intellectually. So it's a different way of communicating. We now communicate most of our lives, 98% of the day through words as we are right now. We do it through words. Music takes us to a different realm, a different way of thinking, a different way of feeling because it's sound, it's tone, it's not words. And the tone that a violinist plays in Chicago 
sounds exactly as the as the tone he plays in Warsaw. Although I know the tuning may a bit be a bit sharper in the United States, but it's another. It reaches another part of us as humans. I believe it's it's um, it's not it's not grounded to the earth by words, sentence structures. It frees us. It liberates us. And what is a world without music? I had that experience a couple of weeks ago when the, when the sound system in my car broke. And rides that used to take five minutes, it seemed, now take two hours. I cannot be without music in my life. No day, no part of the day, except when I'm writing. So um, we don't know why. I don't think we know why. We know why people have to eat to live. We know why, why we have certain desires, why we do everything, but we, there's no explanation really, no, no biological explanation for why we need music. And that's the mystery and the magic of it because we still need it. And I can't imagine life without it. That's a beautiful way to look at it and very, very interesting. Okay, now let's take a look at the other side of Howard Reich. First, tell us about the author Howard who has written six books. Well, um, I started my career in newspapers, of course, but sometimes stories get so big that a newspaper cannot contain them. And once I wrote my first book in 1993, which was a biography of Van Cliburn, the famous concert pianist, I realized that I also needed that large form uh, because, and I love them both. I love writing a piece that you write tonight and two hours later it's online or eight hours later it's on the street in the newspaper. That is thrilling because there's almost nothing between you and your readers. Certainly not editors, because they don't have much time to mess with it. It's got to get out there. That's thrilling. But then with a book, you get it exactly right. You don't hand it in until it's exactly right. Every detail, every comma, every fact is triple checked. It's not on the fly. It's, it's deep and it's for all time. And so that became very satisfying to me. So after the Van Cliburn book, I wrote other books, a biography of Jelly Roll Morton, uh, who I mentioned, I, I consider the first jazz composer, a um, couple of collections of my, of my writings in newspapers and magazines, and then a book about trying to find out what happened to my mother during the Holocaust, and most recently a book that I worked on with Professor Elie Wiesel, uh, who's a Holocaust survivor and became a close friend of mine. So it was just, it's like a larger canvas. It was a chance for me to work on a much larger canvas that endures for a longer time. And uh, I love both forums, but, but uh, and they're both indispensable to me. Are these books still available? They're all available thanks to Amazon. Nothing ever dies in the world of books. Uh, so even if a book goes out of print, somebody in Timbuktu is selling an overpriced copy of it. I was amazed at how little and how much people are getting for some of my books. It's incredible. Uh, but I, I. I tune out the business side of it. You know, I'm just working on the books, but they're all available. They're all on my website, howardreich.com. And um, it's, uh, it's a privilege to get to work on these things and to get to spend a year or two or three years telling one deep, richly textured story. Okay, good. And, and we'll, uh, we'll put some links on the, on the uh, closing credits so that people can, can find these. I know from uh, personal experience with my wife, Jackie, and you, uh, how deeply you write. And uh, thank you for all that, Howard. It's beautiful. All right, you're also a filmmaker. So give us a synopsis of those three documentary films that you've done. So I like to call myself an accidental filmmaker. <laughs> um, it's an accident this happened. I never planned it. I don't know how it happened. But what happened was in, in 2003, I wrote a a big 10,000 word special section in the Chicago Tribune about my mother. My mother, like my father, they're both Holocaust survivors, but they told us very little about what happened to them. This was typical. Most survivors did not want to burden their children with the story and they didn't want to re relive it, of course. And they all have, they've said it's, there are no words to describe what happened. But on the night of uh, February, um, I'm not sure what night, on the night of February, I, I, on, on a night in 19, in 2001, that's it. My mother ran out of her house. I guess it was, yeah, 2001, ran out of her house, packed two shopping bags and ran for her life. She felt someone was trying to kill her. 
and she was picked up by the Skokie police. And the next night that happened again. It took us a year to figure out my mother was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. She was reliving this childhood experience of hers during the Holocaust, which I didn't know what it is. And I began to study that personally. And then that became a story in the Tribune to figure out what happened. And I basically found out that during those three years from 1942 to 1945, my mother was a child running and hiding for her life. That became a big story in the Tribune. And after it came out, it was amazing. The morning that story was online in 2003, I start, we started getting emails. And the internet wasn't even as ubiquitous as it is now. Started getting emails from met from Mexico, Germany, Paris, people around the world were responding to this story, you know? And so people started telling me, you should turn this into a book and you should turn it into a film. So a book, a book I knew how to do, a film I had no idea. I contacted Cartemquin Films, which is a famous documentary house in Chicago. They immediately wanted to make the film. That became a film was broadcast on uh, PBS nationally. And that's how my film career began with this film, Prisoner of Her Past, which is also the title of uh, my book about my mother. And that led to another film that we did at the Tribune called Kenwood's Journey about the students at Kenwood Academy High School getting to perform for the first time in, uh, at Orchestra Hall and that won an Emmy Award. And now my newest film uh, is called, uh, it's newest film actually, I should say it's me and my collaborators and it's called For the Left Hand. And it's about a Chicago man who was, who discovered his love of the piano when he was five years old. He was growing up in the housing projects on the South Side. And when he was 10 years old, this tragic thing happened to him. His father, who was suffering from mental illness, attacked hit the young boy and his two younger brothers while they were sleeping. And then the father killed himself. Norman, the subject of the film, survived and still wanted to be a pianist. He did not know that there, there's over 200 years of music written for left hand alone. But the people at the Chicago Public Schools also did not know that. They told him, not only did they tell him it was ridiculous for him to try to be a pianist, they signed him up for a psychiatric evaluation. He must be crazy if he thinks he can play with one hand. He, anyway, eventually he found a teacher and he became a music major at DePaul University. Got a, it took him nine years to complete his undergraduate degree. He completed it, was a very successful high school choral teacher in the Chicago Public Schools, but never told anyone outside of his immediate family through all that time uh, what happened to him, why he was now paralyzed on his right side, nor that he was still practicing the left-hand repertoire for all those years, including Ravel's concerto for the left hand, which he'd been practicing and studying for 60 years. Hmm. I heard about him through mutual friends a couple, a few years ago, in 2015, I guess. I uh, asked if I could meet him. I wrote another big Tribune series. And then when the series ran, I thought, well, that's it. That was a great experience. When the series hit, Norman Malone, for the first time in his life at age 78, started getting invitations to give concerts. And now when he's going to be giving his concert debut at age 78, I thought, this is a film. This we must film. And a few months later, he was invited to play the Ravel Piano Concerto, which he had never played with orchestra, with, with orchestra in his life, the week he turned 79. We filmed that. We told this whole story in this film, uh, For the Left Hand, which is having its Chicago premiere at the Chicago International Film Festival in October, and will be seen nationwide on TV later this year. So this is a project still still in works, right? The film is completed. We're now in the process of uh, bringing out the film. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Well, I, I'm looking forward to seeing that. But I must say on your first two films, they are absolutely spectacular. The, uh, the one about your mother and, and all the things that she went through is just, it's gripping. And the one with the Kenwood Academy uh, was really special. And uh, as I mentioned to you before we began the interview, we spoke with Deborah Rudder last week, who was your partner in that process of going through that. And uh, it, was, it was such a great outreach musically into the city of Chicago. And and very successful. Thank you. So you have had some kind of a career that most people could only dream of having, Howard. And I know that, that you feel that yourself. So today you're retired, but I don't think you're really retired. So, but I know you're very busy. So let us in on some of those activities. Uh, so you're exactly right. I'm retired from the Chicago Tribune, but I'm not retired. As long as I can type, I will keep typing. So my main project this year has been uh, finishing up 
the Norman Malone film for the left hand with, with my colleagues. And now the process of bringing it out, I'll be touring the country all through October and part of November. We've got uh, screening dates into June of next year. So a lot of my time will be spent traveling with that film and telling that story. Uh, so I've got another project uh, that has been taking up the other half of my time, I suppose, uh, which has not really been announced yet, uh, but it's very unusual. It's not a film, uh, but it's another form of storytelling. Uh, that when it's announced, I'll be excited to share with the world and people will be very surprised. Um, I'm occasionally invited to write uh, an article. I will, I do that sporadically. I do a lot of speaking engagements. Um, and so people ask me, so what are you? Are you a writer? Are you an author? Are you a filmmaker? Are you a joke? Um, I, if I have to sum it up in one word, I'm a writer. These are all different ways of expressing my thoughts and, and, uh, and what I feel I've learned, whether it's in a book, an article, a film, uh, other stage works that I'm involved in. Uh, it, I, I'm just writing. I'm just, I've been writing since I was five years old. You know, the only difference now is I'm published more widely than at that point. Uh, so that's, but there are a lot of projects coming up that I'll be glad to, uh, the next big one I'll be announcing later this year. I can hardly wait. That's great. And you are a writer, but you know what else you are? You're a treasure. Oh, You're a treasure you. to this world in music and beyond because uh, of the deepness of your caring and your heart is so full. But I want to tell the viewers a little story before uh, we finish this. Uh, in, in, in past interviews, we've always contacted the person in advance and said, uh, you know, we'll send you a list of proposed questions and, and you know, we'll go, go through that and, and, and do the interview. So I did that with Howard. Guess what he said? I don't want to see the questions. <laughs> and the beautiful part was that he said, let's improvise. That's what jazz is all about. Yeah. So we did. And, and can you talk a little bit about that philosophy, yeah. that approach? I'm so glad you mentioned that. This happens to me all the time, especially if I'm, if I'm going to be on radio or TV. They want to send me the questions. In the and I tell them, don't send me the questions. And they don't believe me. You at least believe me. They don't believe me. They send me the questions anyway. So I've got to close my eyes to not see the questions, to answer the message that I'm not looking at the questions. Uh, and so I don't want to. I, I don't want to rehearse my answers. I want it to be spontaneous. That's just how I like to do. When I often, um, sometimes when I'm asked to speak at a university or something, they'll, or on those two occasions when I received, uh, I'm fortunate to receive honorary doctorate degrees, they ask me, could you send us a speech because we'd like to include it in the program? Sorry. I don't have a speech. I'm going to go up there and see what happens. Now, this, I will admit, this gives a certain element of risk on their part. But if you're with me this far of the journey, let's just finish it together, you know? So, um, and then I'm sitting there on stage. They're saying nice things about me before they call me up. And it's every, every inch of this, uh, the graduation ceremony is scripted. And then it says, uh, Howard Wright comes up and there's a big white space. And I thought, right, exactly right. Because this reminds me of another story that is a parallel to jazz. I have been fortunate to be, serve on the jury for the Pulitzer Prize in music four times. But the first time was the most historic. That was in 1997. And among the various entries that we had, there were at least two quote unquote jazz entries. One was from Wynton Marsalis and one was from Ornette Coleman. Hmm. The reason was uh, that we got these jazz entries was that in the 1990s, the Pulitzer board had decided that they need to open up the prize to more than one category. And that category had been classical music from 1943 when William Schumann won the first Pulitzer Prize in music until 1996, uh, which was also um, uh, George Walker of one for uh, a piece, which was also classical. There's so much music in America in addition to classical music. We love classical music. It's, it's indispensable to us, but there is more. And so the Pulitzer boards started putting out messages. We're, we're amending the rules. Uh, we, uh, and, and welcome other, other entries. So we got these two entries. One of them was Wynton Marcellus' Blood on the Fields. On the jury, there are five of us on the jury. I was the only one, uh, because of my role as a critic, who had uh, attended a concert with, uh, and heard the entire piece, which is a over three hour piece. So we're th at the jury, we're listening to the music, and of course the score is there. And the beauty, you come to parts in the score and there's white space there's white space because the musicians are improvising. And it's, uh, it's to say that what is improvised is equally worthy or can be 
to what is composed because improvising we know is a form of composition. It's a form of spontaneous composition. It's also a form of spontaneous combustion. But anyways, there are these white spaces. So the Pulitzer, the Pulitzer uh, jury that I was on unanimously recommended Winston Marcellus's work and two others for the prize. And the board selected Winston Marcellus's Blood in the Fields. And that became the first jazz composition to receive the Pulitzer Prize for Music. And that was a, a, a game-changing event because since then, there have been others. Uh, Ornette Coleman received one and, uh, and Henry Threadgill. And it's, it's, it's to open up the world, not to exclude people, to, but to include people. And this, all, I just bring this to because this idea of improv, improvising is just as improvising uh, is central to jazz. It's not the only thing and some scores are completely written out. It's, it's fundamental to jazz and it's fundamental to the way I think and speak. And that's why I never wanna know the questions in advance that no one will believe me except you. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> you, know, you. You are really a good man. I'm telling you, let's, let's get one more in here real quick. Um, jazz, as we go forward, what do you see happening? Where is it going? What's gonna be the next it? So I think because of the world we're living in, there are going to be there are several next it's. So it's kind of exploded. As we know, a, a, decades ago, in fact, uh, Dizzy Gillespie saw jazz becoming more international. He had the United Nation Orchestra and all of that. So it's more international. It's more diverse. Uh, there are more pockets. There's no one thing. I don't think we'll ever see this is the bebop era. This is the swing era. This is the po hard bop era. You know, that... The, the, they're, they're just like they're not three TV networks anymore. They're 500. There aren't two or three sounds anymore. Um, and even so, I can never forget what Joe Siegel, the famous owner of the Jazz Showcase, used to call bebop, the language of the music of the future. I, I still think that bebop is kind of central to understanding what jazz is. And it is a central language, but there are many languages because you, uh, you know, Vijay Iyer bringing these uh, South Asian sounds into it and, uh, and Jason Moran, bringing contemporary music sounds into it. Jazz is whatever we make it. Or I should say whatever the jazz musicians make it. There's no code, there's no rules. Um, it just has to engage us, you know? And we each decide for ourselves what jazz is. There's some things I don't consider jazz that others do. That's fine. The more voices, the many. Why? Because it gives me more choices to, to choose from. More, it gives us more options. So um, I just want to say to you as an educator, how, how crucial educators and education has been to the survival of jazz. Because in the 1960s and 70s, when the world went running off into rock music and the British invasion, all that, uh, the, the commercial possibilities of jazz took a nosedive as we, as we know. And it looked, many people thought that the end is near, jazz is dead. And it, as we know, Dave Brubick went out to college campuses in the 50s and 60s and built that audience. And now there's hardly even a, 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 decent jazz, a decent university without a jazz program. And that is what has really, to me, perpetuated the art form during its most fallow period, during its most periods of struggle, is all these audiences built at the school, all these musicians trained at the school. And um, there's a tendency to, to knock, uh, knock school educated uh, musicians, which is so unfair. It's true that earlier jazz musicians did not, some of them did not go to school. In New Orleans at the end of the uh, 19th century, the, the French Creoles were trained. But anyway, um, they would have loved to have had a chance to study. They didn't have the opportunity to study. They had to pick it up in the bandstand. I think nowadays you will not find a jazz musician under 50 who is not trained, who's not trained. But there's two forms of training. There's a school and there's the bandstand and they both enrich you. So I've just gone a far afield here, but I, I just revere uh, what jazz educators have done to keep this art form uh, prospering and flourishing artistically through all these decades. I agree with you completely. And just let me tag on to, to the comments that you made. It's, it's true today, even in the middle school and high schools, almost every school has at least one jazz band. And throughout my career, I've seen a lot of them and, and they're, they're developing consumers for right. sure. An for audience. Sure. And here's yeah. the amazing thing. Jazz, you know, you can hardly find it on the radio. You can, it certainly can't find it on TV, on free TV. And yet, if you're a high schooler, 
it's still cool to be in the jazz band. Mm -hmm. It's still a cool thing to do. Girls still think it's cool if you're playing saxophone <laughs> in the jazz band. And that will always attract young musicians. <laughs> now you're getting to the heart of the thing. Right, now we're getting down to it. <laughs> this, is, this is also uh, true that on YouTube is the entire history of jazz that, that students can see. Right. And so it's all there and it is our national treasure. Yeah, I, I mean, it is, it's, um, so it may be a cliche, but it's so fundamental to, to America. Winton Marcellus, of course, always talks about democracy and jazz as being a metaphor to democracy because we've got to work together and yet everybody gets to do a solo, you know, and you get to be a solo for as long as your solo is good. You know, it's a, it's a democracy and a meritocracy. Uh, and so uh, the world reveres us. The world reveres the United States for jazz. That's why the State Department sent out Dizzy Gillespie and Louis Armstrong in the mid 20th century, because it gives us a great reputation and it still does. And I wish the United States would revere this music as, rest, as much as the rest of the world does, but I'm glad that everyone else does. So maybe what the answer to our uh, current situation in the States is everybody needs to take jazz. Everybody needs to hit play an instrument and get involved and share and learn all of this as Winton has said. Yeah, and also even in our, uh, one of the reasons the Cartemkin People Film Company wanted to make For the Left Hand about Norman Malone is that there's a big part in there about music education. And the director of the film, Gordon Quinn, feels you have not had a complete education unless it has also included music and the arts. In other words, they talk about STEM, but here in, in Highland Park High School, they talk about STEAM and the A is the art in between, you know, and you are not a fully rounded individual if you have not had some exposure to the arts. And that's what I think all of us have been championing our whole careers. Absolutely. Howard, this has been fabulous. I'm telling you, it's just been such an honor to be with you today. You've, you've long been a hero of mine, and I know so many others as well. Your work is so appreciated, and your impact has been priceless. Thanks again, my friend. Thank you. Thank you so much. An honor to be here with you, Dick. Thank you. Thank you so much, Howard. To our viewers, thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed the interview found valuable information included. Please watch for future episodes.